Good morning and welcome to Hope. Thanks for spending part of your day with us today. Our service will be getting started in just a minute as children's ministry pastor, Trisha Taylor gets up to share this month's memory verse and motions to go along with it for our kids. After that, we'll be moving into worship and the lyrics will be on the screen for you so you can follow along and sing if you feel comfortable. Then Pastor Tim Taylor will be continuing the series that we've started on the book of Acts and seeing how the different challenges and difficulties that the early church faced led to the way that grew and developed into the church that we see today. We know that many of the plans that God had for the early church and the church here at Hope involve youth and children, and we would love to connect with yours. You can go to hopegh.com and fill out a connection card there. That will give us all the information we need to send them the details on the different things happening over the course of the week with the children's ministry and the student ministry here at Hope. We're going to get started in just a minute now, but what I want to mention for everyone who is currently worshiping with us in person in our sanctuary is that when you came in this morning, you were asked to wear a mask to and from your seat. And we would love for you to continue doing so. If you have to get up and use the restroom or in your process of going out uh, back out the building. So please be aware of that this morning. Now, as we begin, would you pray with me to get started? Father God, we're so grateful for a new day. God, we ask that you would continue to remind us of our purpose in the midst of crazy, in the midst of lives that have ups and downs and some weeks feel like triumphs and some weeks feel like failures, God. But we know that despite all those things, that you are a constant, that you are a thing that we can rely on, God, and that you will not let us down. You will not let us go. So God, let us hold on to that. Let's hold on to our purpose of of following you, of worshiping you, of raising your name high, God, and spreading spreading the the good news of, of who you are and how our sins have been forgiven because of what your sin did on the cross. God, may that be our focus this week. In your name we pray. Amen. Psalm 145, 3. Lord, you are great. You are really worthy of praise. No one can completely understand how great you are. Psalm 145, verse 3.
find hope and welcome to our family room. This is the place where everyone is welcome. This is the place where we can come together, either in the building or you at home with your Hope at Home group, and learn together how to go out there and join God to bring heaven here. That you can join God to bring heaven everywhere that you go. Now, now I want to give you a heads up. I'm coming off a week of vacation, and I am ready to go. So hopefully you're ready too. But before I jump into our study of Acts today, I want to say thanks to Matt, who did a tremendous job last week like he always did. I I also want to share with you some of the things that God made clear to me while I was away that apply to everyone. This is deep, so so I hope you're ready. Are, Are you ready? Here it is. Rest isn't just good. It's essential. Let me repeat that so you can write it down. Rest isn't just good, it's essential. Jesus said in Mark 2.27 that the Sabbath, a day set aside for rest, was made for us. What, What this is saying is that we need to work hard six days of the week, but that we need rest too, and it needs to be a part of the rhythm to our life. Some of you work jobs that have moments that are super busy, but hear me clearly. Even in the midst of the busyness, rest needs to be a part of your rhythm. And over the past five months, because of COVID, our rhythm has really gotten messed up. I figured because I was working from home that I was getting rest all the time. But what was really happening was that my boundaries had been eliminated. I loved getting to play basketball with Ben when I needed a break. That that was a part of working at home that has been awesome. But as I reflected back over the past five months, I realized that I never really stopped working. I'd open my laptop at night and, and do a little more work on the message whenever I had a free moment. So I never really disconnected. I'd, I'd jump on a Zoom meeting almost every night of the week there was always something that I thought had to get done. And so I never took a complete day to disengage from work and do what God had commanded us to do, rest. So what I I found when I was away was that I was exhausted because I hadn't built into my rhythm rest, Sabbath. Notice I didn't say escape. There's a difference between rest and escaping. Stopping meeting together with other people. We need each other. So please, don't hear this as an excuse to stop meeting together. But what I realized as I've talked with people this week was that I wasn't alone. I I wasn't the only one that had been running so hard and not resting. In fact, for some, it's, it's a contest, a badge of honor. I haven't had a day off for months, some in years. And we think it's a good thing, even though the Bible has made it clear this needs to be a part of our life. It needs to be a part of our rhythm and how we do life. So please hear me. If you're working from home still, and I know a lot of you are, please make sure that you're creating boundaries and getting into a rhythm of rest. Because you need it. And if you're back to work already, that's great. But make sure that rest is part of your life. It's part of your rhythm too. And this is why. This is what God has been speaking to me for a while. But but I heard it so much clearer when I was away on vacation last week. Right now, God is doing a new thing. He's speaking to people all across the globe. And he's trying to get our attention. But, But what I found is that I was too tired to hear. We're, we're too tired to hear clearly what God is trying to say to us. And so instead of doing what God wants us to do now, a, a new thing, we rush back to what we did before. Because it's safe. It's comfortable. It's what we know. And we miss out on what God is wanting us to do. So I want to pray for us all right now that that you will take the rest that you need and that you'll hear what God has to say to you 
and that you'll have the courage to do this new thing that, what, that God wants to do in your life. Let me pray. God, I am praying for us all. I'm praying that as we go through this, this continuation of the pandemic, that as we're forced to maybe rest more, that, that we will actually rest, that we will put into our life this rhythm of rest, the ability to Sabbath so that we can hear clearly what you're speaking to us now. And God, I pray that as you speak to us, that we will hear you and we will have the boldness of our faith to follow you and do what you're asking so that together, as a church, we can enjoy the best that you have to offer us. God, I pray that you will speak through your words today in the book of Acts, that you'll open our ears and our hearts to hear. God, use me. God, use those that are listening, that together we can be the church that will bring you glory. And through us, your kingdom will come. Your will will be done here on earth just like it is in heaven. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Uh, all right, I, I want to encourage everyone to get your Bibles out now uh, and turn to the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 4, we'll be picking up where Matt left off at verse 32. Uh, re remember, we're in this series going through Acts and discovering how the very first church, the people of God, doing the things of God, followed God into the unknown together. What they were doing had never been done before. And so far, everything's been pretty good. There are multiple times that it states that thousands of people were added to the numbers at once. I, I think that's pretty good. I, I think we have a lot to learn from them. And it says in verse 32 that all of the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. This means that the disciples were doing the things that Jesus did through the power that God had given them. And this same power that raised Jesus from the dead it's been given to you as well through the Holy Spirit. In, in verse 33, it says, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them and in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to everyone who had need. Can we all agree that this whole section is amazing. It starts out declaring that the people that were a part of the church were so surrendered to Christ that even though they had differences, different occupations, different education, different ethnicities, different economic status, because they had surrendered all that they were to follow Christ, they had unity. They had unity in Christ. They were united in what they thought and what they did. This is what Jesus prayed for in John 17, that we would be one, and they were doing it. We need to understand that there is power in unity, power for good and bad, but the good, th this is why we need to be united as a church in doing what God wants us to do. It doesn't mean that we have to, to be united in where we meet. We can meet all over the globe but we need to be united in what God wants from the church, the, the people of God doing the things of God, sharing the love of God with the world that he came to save. And, and one of the ways that we get united is to surrender our lives completely to God. It's no longer about me. It's about him and what he wants. We gain unity in Christ when we stop holding on so tightly to what I want, my preferences, our desires. We gain unity when we start to seek first the kingdom of God together. God, what do you want? God, what's your desire for us as a church? 
And in Acts, it says this is how they were living. And, and I read it to you. It's radical. The people were living so surrendered to God that they were living their lives with open fists about everything. They weren't holding on to anything. It wasn't theirs to be holding. So they were willing to give it all away because they understood it was all about God. They were willing to live this way if it meant they could do what God asked them to do. I, I wonder, I wonder if you're being honest, what's one thing that is hard for you to let go of? I want to give everyone a minute and not just think about what would be hard for you to let go of. I want you to name it. When we name it out loud, it can't live in the shadows anymore, and we have hope to overcome it. So take a minute now and name at least one thing that is hard for you to let go of when it comes to your life, when it comes to your church. It might be music. It might be a location. It might be a program for you personally. It might be your house. It might be your shoes. It might be the, the dreams you have for your kids. I don't know what it might be, but name at least one thing that it would be hard for you to let go of. Remember, you're not letting go of things for fun. You're surrendering everything for a reason. You're doing it so that you can live the way that God wants you to live together as a church. And one of the traits of a church that we're all supposed to have is that we're supposed to love each other. So in Acts, they surrendered everything so they could love each other like they'd been loved. Which if you think about it, it's pretty extraordinary. The, the way that we're loved took being totally surrendered by Jesus. Jesus loved us by dying for us while we were still sinning. He loved us by surrendering his life, not after we had confessed our sins, not, not after we had changed our behavior, but while we were still sinning. And it's not like he, he was thinking, man, I can't wait to die. He actually asked his father if there was another way, he'd rather do that. But he surrendered his will to do the will of the father. This is radical. And this is how the first church loved each other. And this is how we're supposed to love each other too. Do, do you think you, you, you could love like, like that? The first church sold their land, they sold their, their homes, they sold whatever they had so they could love each other radically, so they could make sure that they loved like they had been loved. 
They wanted to make sure that they joined God in loving others by making sure everyone had their needs met. This is extreme surrender. This is radical love, and it makes me wonder, what would that look like today? What are some examples of extreme surrender that maybe God is calling you to live today? What what is a radical way that God is calling us to love? Take a minute and think about it and share with others around you. This extreme living, this radical loving is different than how the world is living today. The world is divided. The world is self-centered. And we have a chance to show them something different, to show them Jesus. We have a chance to be united and love radically different than what they see every day on the news. There is real power in unity. Unity with God, unity with others. And to have true unity with with others, we have to surrender everything. Another thing that we have to do if we want to be united, surrendered, surrendered, is stop hiding. Stop pretending. Acts compares two people at the end of chapter 4 and at the beginning of chapter 5 that are completely different. The first is Joseph, who they called Barnabas. It, It wasn't his real name, but But the way that he lived encouraged other people, it says. He lived his life as an open book. We we know that he was a Levite. We know that, that he was from the town of Cyprus. And we know that he sold some land and didn't hide any of it, of what he sold. He brought it all to the disciples. Now, Now compare that with Ananias and his wife Sapphira. They sold land and conspired to hide how much they had sold the land for. It doesn't say anywhere that they had to give it all to the church, but they hid. They lied about what they had done. They hid the truth. They wanted the praise of Barnabas without living the life that he lived, the surrendered life that he lived. And what follows is one of the most shocking stories in the Bible. Peter confronts Ananias about hiding, about lying. And when he gets done with it, Ananias drops dead. And it says that his wife was running a little late. She shows up three hours later. And Peter gives her a chance, come clean, stop hiding. But she tells the same story. She hides too. She too wants the praise of Barnabas without being totally surrendered with God, without being totally honest to God. And it says that as Peter confronted her sin, 
that she dropped dead as well. And then one of the most understated verses in the Bible, it says, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. You think? But it didn't stop the church from growing. People were afraid to get close to Peter, but God continued to add to their numbers daily. Let me quickly apply this to us here at Hope. The, the first, I hope that you see that even the first church where everything seemed to be going great wasn't perfect. There is no perfect church. Charles Spurgeon famously said if he ever found a perfect group of people that he'd hesitate to join them because he'd make it imperfect. There is no such thing as a perfect church. We're all imperfect people in need of a perfect God. So stop hiding. Stop pretending that you've got your stuff together. Stop posting the perfect pictures with everyone smiling all the time. We know minutes before someone was crying. Stop hiding your, your addictions, your struggles, and start admitting your imperfections to each other and God. Because when we hide, we lie to God, and we lie to ourselves, and we lie to others. We eventually believe the lies and we think we don't need help. In fact, we need to be the one helping others. And we refuse the help that God wants to provide for us. We miss out on the best that God wants to give us. And another thing, if you're hiding, you're, you're not going to like this part. But church, if you see someone that's hiding, care about them enough. Love them enough. Love them enough and care enough about the church to have the boldness to confront them in love. The first church continued to thrive because Peter confronted the sin right away. He didn't let it fester. He didn't let the sin grow. And listen, I don't take it lightly that it says that everyone was afraid either. I'm sure they were. But sometimes fear inspires us to live the way that God wants us to live. And the way that God wants us to live is together as a church, united, surrendered in him. Now we're going to take a few minutes uh, here live to answer questions about today's passage. In the coming weeks, we're hoping to be able to stream the message live and allow those that are watching online to ask questions too. So everyone, before I begin to answer questions live, take time this week to prepare for next week and read the sections that we'll be studying together. Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 42. Have a great week. Amen. This is a tough passage today. Uh, there's some parts of that passage that are hard for us to wrap our minds around and understand uh, what God was doing in that moment. And you know what? I think that's okay. Um, I think when we get uncomfortable with things uh, in our faith, uncomfortable with things that we might read in God's word, I think our knee-jerk reaction a lot of times is to brush it under the rug, pretend like we didn't come across it, or pretend like it's not there and move on. But I think we serve a God that invites us to take that stuff right to him, to wrestle with him and to say, God, I, I don't understand your heart here, but I want to understand your heart here. I want to understand more about who you are. Um, and this is precisely why we've been responding consistently with the Psalms week in and week out. Because the Psalms teach us about transparency, about vulnerability, about honesty, full honesty uh, with God and the areas that we're comfortable with and then the areas that we're uncomfortable with. And today is no different. Um, we're going to respond today to God's word by reading from Psalm 139 together as a prayer. And this is a Psalm of David. A psalm of surrender, which we've been focusing on, but surrender through transparency of saying, God, you know my heart, you know the ways that are within me, search me, find every area of me, find every offensive way in me. I think this is a powerful, powerful prayer uh, that David prays. 
And I, I'm excited for us to engage with this today. I will acknowledge that there, again, like other parts of scripture, there's a part of this psalm that's going to make us uncomfortable when we get to it. And it's when David starts talking about enemies, and specifically enemies of God. And he asks God uh, to come and slay the wicked. Um, he says, do I not hate those who hate you, God? Uh, almost as if to say, isn't this the way? And as we know, and this is another thing for us to learn, is that scripture interprets scripture, that we need to read uh, when we're uncomfortable with different words that we find. We need to read God's word as a whole and ask ourselves, where are we informed about God's character in other parts of the Bible that can help us answer the dissonance that we're feeling right now, to address the dissonance that we're feeling right now? Sometimes the dissonance remains. Sometimes... Uh, the unknowns and the unanswered questions remain. But I know that as we start speaking of enemies, and we're going to read through that part of this psalm, uh, we acknowledge that through the grace and through the work of the cross, through what Jesus has done for us, that Jesus himself asked us to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us. But the reason we're leaving this in the psalm, and I'll be done with this mini sermon here in a second, the reason we're leaving that language here in the psalm is to acknowledge that there are enemies. Even in those words from Jesus, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, saying enemies do exist. They are around you. Enemies, uh, person enemies, enemies of God that exist, but our response to that should be love, should be compassion, should be prayer. And we have that love and compassion because we find ourselves as enemies of God originally, that we were all enemies of God. I was an enemy of God. And while I was still an enemy, God found me. He spoke to my heart. He told me that he loved me and he called me his. And I think that's powerful. So we're going to leave those words in there for us to wrestle with. Uh, continue to read. And so we're going to read through Psalm 139 together. I'm going to read as we've been doing the italicized text that you'll see on your screen. Uh, and then the bolded text, I would encourage you to join with me and read out loud. And then we'll sing a short refrain from this psalm to kind of cap it up. So again, uh, Psalm 139, if you've got your Bible near you and you'd like to open that and follow along that way too, you're welcome to. But let's take a deep breath and then we'll read and pray together. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. We read together. Before a word is on my tongue, you, O Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. 
How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. We read, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me and lead Search me. of us so intimately that no thought in our minds or cell in our bodies is hid from your eyes. 
secure in the loving embrace, embrace of our brother, Jesus Christ, we open up our hearts and lives to your searching gaze. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we surrender today and we work towards surrendering tomorrow. We rest in your hands and we pray all these things through the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Thanks for joining us for today's service. We hope that you've been challenged and encouraged by the study in the book of Acts as we follow God into the unknown together as a church. Don't forget that there is helpful information for this series on our website at www.hopegh.com as you continue to connect with your Hope at Home groups. If you have children, hopefully you've been getting the weekly emails that we send out to you and connecting at theparentq.org forward slash faith for the video content for the kids. If you want any information about anything at Hope, please email us at info at hopegh.com. Remember, if you want to join us in person next week, you'll have to pre-register online at www.hopegh.com. But for now, we hope that you have a great week and we'll see you next week as we continue our series in the book of Acts and discover how we can follow God into the unknown together.